Luke chapter 16 and 17. Yes, I'll do 17 as well. Okay. Uh, so before this, Yeshua told us the story about the prodigal son. And then he continued. There was a certain rich man who had a steward. An accusation was brought to, the, to him that this man was wasting goods. He called him and said, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship, for you can no longer be steward. Let me read from Eugene's because um, these are parables and Eugene does them so well. Yes, was running up huge personal expenses. Yeshua called, uh, sorry, the uh, owner, the rich man called him and said, what is this I hear about you? You're fired. I want a complete audit of your books. The manager said, what am I going to do? I've lost my job. As a manager, he said to himself, I'm not strong enough for a laboring job and I'm too proud to beg. Ah, I've got a plan. Here's what I'll do. And when I'm then when I'm turned out into the street, people will take me to their houses. He went at it. One after the other, he called in the people who were in debt to his master and said to them, How much do you owe my master? And the person replied, A hundred jugs of olive oil. The manager said, Here, take your bill. Sit down here. Quickly, write fifty. To the next he said, And you? What do you, what do you owe? And he said, a hundred sacks of wheat. He took the bill and said, write 80. Now here's a surprise. The master praised the crooked manager. Why? Because he knew how to look after himself. Streetwise people are smarter in this regard than law-abiding citizens. They're on constant alert, looking for angles, surviving by their wits. I want you to be smart in the same way. But for what is right, use every adverse adversity to stimulate you to creative survival, to concentrate your attention on the bare essentials so you live, really live, not complacently just to get by on good behavior. Gosh, what does this even mean? Uh, the shrewd manager. So what does Yeshua say? I say this to you, make friends for yourself by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. <laughs> he who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. He who is unjust in what is least is also unjust in much. Therefore, if you've been, you have not been faithful in the, un, in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust true riches? If you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? No servant can serve two masters. He will either hate the one and love the other, or be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is money, material things. You can't serve God, which is spirit, and mammon, which is flesh. Um, what is his? I, I think we need some reading here because it's so surprising. I, I've read this so many times and I, I'm surprised at how I'm still surprised. He says, um, our use of money is a good test of the Lordship of Christ. Let our resources... Let us use our resources wisely because they belong to God and not to us. Money can be used for good or evil. Let us use ours for good. Money has a lot of power, so we must use it carefully and thoughtfully. We must use our material goods in a way that will foster faith and obedience. Mammon means money. We are to make wise use of, this financial of the financial opportunities we have. Not to earn heaven, but so that heaven will be a welcome experience for those we help. If we use our money to help those in need or to help others find Christ, our earthly investments will bring eternal benefit. 
when we obey God's will, the unselfish use of possessions will follow. And that's so true. Um, Make friends for yourself by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. Use your money to bless people. so that they can find heaven, they can find Christ, they can find God. Wow. And then he says, Yeshua went on to make these comments. If you're honest in small things, you'll be honest in big things. If you're a crook in small things, you'll be a crook in big things. If you're not honest, the crow is saying something. I love crows. Yeah, they're so clever. If you're not honest in small jobs, who will put you in charge of the store? No worker can serve two bosses. He will either hate the first and love the second, or adore the first and hate the second. You can you cannot serve both God and the bank. When the Pharisees, a money obsessed bunch, heard him say these things, they rolled their eyes dismissed him as hopelessly out of touch. Yeshua spoke to them and said, You are masters at making yourselves look good in front of others, but God knows what's behind your appearance. Wow. You are, you are those who justify yourselves before God, but God knows your heart. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Wow. What society sees and calls monumental, God sees and calls monstrous. God's law and the prophets climaxed in John. Now it's all kingdom of God, the good news and compelling invitation to every man and woman The sky will disintegrate and the earth will dissolve before a second letter of God's law wears out. Using the legalities of divorce as a cover for lust and adultery, using the legalities of marriage as a cover for lust and adultery. Let's see what it says here. Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. Whoever marries her, who is divorced from her husband, commits adultery. Then Yeshua talks about the rich man and Lazarus, Lazarus the beggar. There was once a rich man, expensively dressed in the latest fashions, wasting his days in conspicuous consumption. My father used to love this word, this phrase, conspicuous consumption. It was abhorrent to him. The great Indian, the great big fat Indian wedding All these things were abhorrent to my father. He just believed that in a country as poor as India, for the rich to be um, flashing their wealth was utterly distasteful. Yes, of course, there are the business people who say, well, we keep the machinery functioning. We keep people in business. We keep jobs on the go. If we didn't spend there would be no earning. But you know what? All of that is capitalistic thinking. Everyone's pushing um, the stock market for the investor who's earning with no work. Always breaks my heart to see these lavish weddings with beggars and Poor people outside looking in, oh my gosh. And it's all, doesn't matter, I don't want to comment on that. Anyway, so then, a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, had been dumped on his doorstep. All he lived for was to get a meal from the scraps at the rich man's table. His best friends were the dogs who came and licked his sores. And then he died. This poor man, 
and was taken up by angels into the lap of Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. When the poor man died, he was taken up by angels into the lap of Abraham in heaven. The rich man died and was buried. You know, everything that they put in the Bible, the way it is said has specific meaning. Let's see, read it from the original. When the beggar died, he was carried by angels to Abraham's bosom. There was no one to, there's no one to bury the poor. The rich man also died and was buried. Gosh, it's exactly the same. In hell and in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham in the distance and Lazarus on his lap. He called out, Father Abraham, mercy, have mercy. Send Lazarus to dip his finger in cool water to cool my tongue. I am in agony in this fire. And Abraham said, Child, remember that in your lifetime, you got the good things and Lazarus the bad. It's not like that here. Here he is consoled and you are tormented. Besides, in all these matters, there is a huge, huge chasm set between us. So no one can go from here to you, even if he wanted to. Nor can anyone cross over from you to us. The rich man said, Then let me ask you, Father. Send him to the house of my father, where I have five brothers, so he can tell them the score and warn them, so that they will not end up in this place of torment. Abraham answered and said, They have Moses and the prophets to tell them the score. Let them listen to them. Let's see how he says it here. What is the score? And he says that they may testify. I beg you, Father, send them to my family so that he may testify to them lest they also come to this place of torment. And Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear him. And he said, no, Father Abraham. They are not listening. If someone came back to them from the dead, they would change their ways. And Abraham said, if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they are not going to be convinced by someone who raises from the dead, rises from the dead. Yeshua rose from the dead. Every word written in his word, in this book, tells us what to expect, what is to come. Repent and return to God. That's the message. But hearing we do not hear and seeing we do not see. Why is Yeshua saying this? If they won't listen to Abraham and the prophets, to Moses and the prophets, they are not going to be convinced by someone who rises from the dead. He, is already, he already knows that a huge part of the world is not going to listen to the testimony of those who testify of Yeshua rising from the dead. That was the book of Luke chapter 16.